Well, Jesus has been baptized. He has gone into the wilderness, endured the temptation, and he has now started his work. And if they had social media in the day, it would be, as we say, blowing up. He has been traveling all over Galilee, doing incredible things, speaking incredible words, and people are excited. And in the text that Lisa read for us then, Jesus has come home to his hometown of Nazareth, where he grew up. People there have known him since, well, since, because that's where he lived. Isn't that Joseph's boy, they said? Just a poor carpenter when he left us, but look at him now. He has made it, and we are proud. This is how Luke records this story for us. They say he speaks with such authority, and things were going well. People were slapping him on the back, shaking his hand, until Jesus spoke a second time. Now, one might have thought, at least as we're taught in seminary, get to know your folks. Build relationships. And especially if it's people that you know, in Jesus' case, you know, you'd have thought he'd have said, Wow, Alan, thank you. I couldn't have done what I'm doing today if it hadn't been for you grabbing me as a little boy and teaching me those things. And you guys over there, and I just, I remember spending time at your house, and all of those things helped me. You, You'd have thought he would have softened the crowd up just a little. But instead, Jesus throws the book at them. The Torah, to be specific. Hits them right between the eyes, sets them up with Isaiah, and then gives them a sharp right hook with 1 Kings. Everybody, what got into Jesus? I mean, nobody's egging him on. They're slapping him on the back saying, what a great job. We are so proud of you. And Jesus turns right around and jabs them. I think it is, as we say, that Jesus knows these people so well. That he knows what message they most need to hear. And Jesus loves them too much not to preach the sermon that he preached. He has just said from the book of Isaiah, he has been anointed to release captives and open the eyes of the blind. So that's what he's going to do. He will speak so as to open their eyes and ears to the truth that God loves the entire world, not just the people who occupy this little strip of land over against the Mediterranean Sea. And that's when they get angry. You see, they wanted him for themselves. They wanted the exclusive rights to whatever he was or would become. Scotty McCrary, anybody know that name? It's from over, he, he won, uh, what, what was the, American Idol, thank you, yeah, yeah. He's from Shelby, North Carolina, by the way, from over where Amy went to college. And so I'd been going for several years over there. Never saw Scotty McCrary's name anywhere until he won. And then, buddy, it was posted everywhere. Home of Scotty McCrary. Good luck, Scotty McCrary. Scotty McCrary eats chicken here. You know, I mean, it, you know, when you become famous, everybody wants a part of you. Jesus' point was, there is no exclusive club for who I am and my message. For I am for all people everywhere, Jesus says. And so for this to come true... People put two and two together. There's going to need to be some changes then. And nobody likes changes. For in order to raise the lowly, God's going to have to bring the powerful down a notch or two. In order to feed the poor, the rich are going to have to do with a little less. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He reads Isaiah, and they've heard it a thousand times, but... Like evidently every time before it went right over the head. They didn't get it the first time. So Jesus drives his point home and this time they get it. In fact, they get it so clearly they're ready to get rid of him. God favor a foreigner? <laughs> God heal a Syrian? That's heresy. And you know what we do with heretics. 
you step back and take a big look at the Gospel of Luke, his whole Gospel is about how Jesus keeps telling the Jewish people the truth. They do not have exclusive rights to God. So here at the beginning, we see how it's going to be in Luke. Jesus telling the truth, and folks who thought they had God in a nice, neat little box getting angrier and madder. Jesus gets away with it today. He walks through, the text tells us, but later on, they'll catch him. They'll listen just a little longer. They'll get a little more irate, and then one day they will lay hands on him and nail him to a cross for this word. So I'm reading this text about these events that occurred in that little town of Nazareth over 2,000 years ago. And I asked myself a question the other day. Hmm. What would happen if Jesus preached that sermon today? Have things changed at all? Do you think Jesus' sermon about change and equity and No special privileges would go over any better today in our country than it did in Nazareth? So I thought, and I'm not so sure it would. You see, it seems to me, as I watch and listen, and I listen to my own life, as long as God says what I want God to say, And as long as God does and acts the way I want God to do and act, then we're fine. But the minute that God changes what God is saying from what I'm thinking, now we've got a problem. You see, throughout history, the messengers of God who have tried to be truthful and speak what God is saying, have always been rejected and beaten. And many have been killed. It is the words of Scripture, right, that say to us, God's ways are not our ways. And we struggle. So I think what was true then is still true. People of every time and place who when they meet one who tells them the truth about themselves that they do not want to hear, they will go to almost any length to silence the messenger. And in the case of those in Nazareth, it was about nationality, national pride. And country. They thought they had the exclusive rights to God. I remind you, as Jesus did, there are no national flags in heaven. None. Be careful what we say we would do if Jesus were here today. So I ask myself another question, what then, how how do I get around this fact that that I'm really not very different from those in Nazareth, that that as long as God lines up with my understanding of God, I'm okay, but the minute God steps out of that and challenges it, what, what am I to do with that? May I suggest that we start by keeping our eyes on the one who told the truth in the first place the one we nailed to the cross. Because of all the prophets, of all the messengers and folks who came and told the truth, only to be rejected and beaten and killed, this one God raised from the dead for us. And in Christ's cross and resurrection, we discover that Jesus' words not only reveal the truth about who we are, They also reveal the truth about God. About a God so passionate for people that God takes on our lot and our life becomes one of us, even to the point of dying for us. Only to come back, bringing again a word of forgiveness and grace 
For this God loves all God's children. Desperately, passionately, relentlessly. And that includes you and me. Good news. Thanks be to God. There's not a scoundrel in this room. Well, there's probably not any scoundrels in this room. There's not an odd man or woman out of culture. There's not someone in this room that everyone else has rejected that God does not love dearly. For God so loved the world. Because when we accept all of that, Jesus tells us the truth about ourselves, then we can surrender every claim to having it all together, to being perfect, to making it on our own. When Jesus tells us the truth about who we are, we can receive it, and as the scriptures say, we can die. But then, what we know about the truth that Jesus tells us about us it's also true about what he says about God. And when he tells us that, we are resurrected. Paul says we are new creation. Our old way of trying to have God our way has been killed. And now we can travel through our lives listening to God, excited about what God is doing. For as the scriptures say, we come alive in the spirit of God who knows everything about us and loves us anyway and goes to any length to redeem us from the lies that we try to live by every day. That's what got the Nazarites so angry. There was a lie they were living by that God was exclusive to them. In fact, that they had God all figured out. Jesus said, no. Listen, listen. No, I don't think much has changed. But there has been some change. And so as I was thinking again about this text, I began to think about you. And I began to think about the years I've spent here in ministry with you. And even today, I look around and I see you, many of you, having been touched by the grace of God, who are now reaching out and bringing good news to the poor. You are proclaiming release to the captives. You are helping to the blind to regain their sight. You are setting the oppressed free. After all, that which Isaiah predicted and Jesus announced is still being fulfilled in our hearing. Even now, even here as you hear these words, and always to the people of God, the word of God propels them out to lives of service and purpose and meaning. <coughs> I want to read the text from Isaiah that Jesus read. There are three times that the word me is in there. When I get to that, I will pause, and I want all of us to speak that word together. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon, because he appointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, let us not grab Jesus to throw him off a cliff today. We do not, as believers in First Baptist Church of Clinton, Tennessee, nor as citizens of the United States of America, have exclusive rights to God. Our God loves all people. May we go and proclaim that as his children. Thanks be to God. Father, we come this day asking <clears throat> forgiveness. When like our brothers and sisters in Nazareth, 
we somehow believe that you are more for us than anybody else because we're good people. We've gone to church. We've taught vacation Bible school. <clears throat> We've served on a committee or two. Forgive us when we think somehow that because we live in this country, somehow we are more loved by you than others. It is hard for us, God, to not claim exclusivity with you. But you will not step in that box. For as much as you love every person in this room, you love every person in the world. Even those today who are rejecting you, even cursing your name, there are tears in your eyes for them. So God, help us. Help us to be your people, your children, not for you to be the God we want you to be. Help us to listen. Help us to respond. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ.